Welcome to another episode of Chefs and Guests on the Spoon Mob podcast. This week, I'm joined by Executive Chef Matt Walton over at the Guild House. If you're unfamiliar with the Guild House, it's a Cameron Mitchell restaurant, so it's part of the Cameron Mitchell restaurant group. They have a bunch of different concepts, but the Guild House is the only one that has its own location. It's kind of standalone in the fact that there's not a location in another state like there is with Ocean Prime and Ocean Club. There's not another location within Columbus like there is with the Avenue or the Pearl or Cap City Fine Diner. Nothing like that. It's pretty unique in the fact that it's a corporate restaurant. People would label it as a corporate restaurant. Matt even labels himself as a corporate chef, which I disagree with. I think he's a chef who works at kind of a corporate restaurant group. He still has creative control over the entire menu. Like he has way more flexibility than you would even probably consider, even with having to do, you know, they do all the food for the dining room, the bar next door, the Soul at the Joseph there, which has a completely different menu than the dining room does. All the banquets, weddings, any catering stuff that they have to do for kind of a corporate event, they do all that stuff. And then they also do the room service too. Plus, the other thing that you have to remember with the Guild House is they're inside a hotel, the Le Meridian Hotel in the Short North. So they pretty much never close. They're open 363 days out of the year. I think they only close for Christmas and maybe New Year's because if people are staying at the hotel, you know, they have to be able to get room service uh, because a lot of places, you know, close. A lot of restaurants are closed, especially in the holidays. So it's become our go-to spot, especially around the holidays. You know, we're getting ready to go out of town or something like that. You don't want to have like groceries laying around or food laying around or anything like that. We usually pop into the Guild House. It's kind of like our kind of go-to around the holidays just because we know they're going to be open and it's great food and it's consistent experience too as well. So uh, if you've never been, I would highly recommend checking it out. I do feel like it's the flagship restaurant for Cameron Mitchell restaurant groups. People might disagree with that and say it's Ocean Prime, you know, which is also called Ocean Club here in Columbus, at least the location over in Easton. But I think it's the Guild House. There's nothing really else in their portfolio that's like it. It's super unique. It's super different, but still fits within their theme. Like I said, Matt has a lot of creative control over kind of if they want to put different dishes on the menu or test stuff out as specials and tinker with them and all this different stuff. So we kind of get into that. His career, pretty much been Columbus chef for most of his career. Had a couple different stints at Cameron Mitchell too as well, but we get into that and pretty much just how he came up and becoming the executive chef at the Guild House and what that's meant and navigating kind of the coronavirus. You know, they were closed for pretty much all of that too as well. So what he did in his off time and future aspirations, you know, so we get into all that here on this episode. Make sure you follow him on Instagram at matt.e.walton is his handle. And you can also follow the Guild House. It's at the Guild House. Uh, they usually put on their Instagram, you know, whatever specials uh, that they have going on for the week. It pretty much changes week to week. So I think Thursday is kind of the big uh, kind of special day for them. At least it's seen that way in the past few weeks. So it was really cool to just sit down and kind of talk with Matt for, you know, a little while. Just kind of his career and everything, get a different perspective from somebody who, you know, has been working in the corporate restaurant group environment for so long. And, and it was funny because I was going to reach out to him anyways. I kind of reach out to chefs in, in different stages you know, in kind of different bundles. I usually wait until, you know, we kind of have maybe one or two episodes still to release, and then I'll reach out to another group just because I don't want anybody to come on the podcast and do an episode and then their episode doesn't come out for like two months. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's fair to somebody, you know, who spends the time out of their, usually their off day to come and record a podcast episode with me. And then it's like, oh yeah, in two months, this will come out. Like that's kind of lame. So I, I don't really approach it that way. It's usually at most, it'll be, a month. So if they record at most, it would be a month later that the episode would, would come out. He actually reached out to me before I could reach out to him. If somebody who listens to the podcast and was like, hey, I'd love to do it, you know, if, if you'd have me on. And I was like, absolutely. You're actually, you know, uh, one of the top three names I was going to reach out to next once we kind of ran down. So we were able to set it up real quick. And it was a great conversation. It was awesome to, you know, get that perspective. Yeah. So like I said, if you haven't been there, check it out. But without further delay, this is my interview with Chef Matt Walton over at the Guildhouse. Thanks for doing this. Always great to, uh, you know, have different perspectives and different people, you know, from Columbus and different chefs on. So I know you've been at the Guildhouse for a couple of years and, and we'll get there. But like with most people, there's not a whole lot of information on a lot of chefs working in Columbus. You know, there's a few articles here or there about people, but for the most part, it's kind of a no man's land. People don't really know a whole lot about the backstories. So Kind of start where I always do with everybody. I mean, how did you wind up getting into cooking at first? I mean, it kind of runs in your family, right? Yeah. I mean, looking back, it was always kind of meant to be. 
So I just didn't always see the path. Kind of grew up. Uh, my mom was a single mom, was spending a lot of time at my grandma's house, uh, always tugging on her apron, cooking along with her in the kitchen. Really, I had zero interest in actually cooking. It was more so the eating part <laughs> that I was a big fan of. So I was always kind of lying in wait for the food and then figuring out through doing it how to make it myself so that I could eat more, honestly, <laughs> of those tasty things that I you know, was always eating. So growing up, my dad kind of bounced around from job to job to uh, was a, in one of those cyclical jobs as line cook wherever, and specifically one of them being at like a little cafe in the, uh, I grew up in Medina, uh, which is Cleveland area, kind of always be in the basement hanging out. And they kind of make me do the odd jobs or make me eat weird shit. And, you know, I fell in love with uh, kind of the pirate ship aspect of that. It was just always exciting. It was always goofy. People were always doing weird shit. And I thought it was really interesting. So I kind of stuck around. <laughs> Eventually, they just started putting me to work. Did you start working like pretty much as soon as you were able to get a job like 13, 14? Definitely. Yeah. I had my first like legitimate job at 15 <laughs> where I was actually legitimately on the payroll. But yeah, before that I was just kind of sweeping floors and doing odd jobs and weird shit like that for, you know, cash or whatever, food, lunch, things like that. So now with your dad being in the industry, you know, and, and working at different restaurants and stuff like that too, have you guys ever try and cook the same thing? Like competition style, like who do you think comes out better? To be uh, totally fair and honest, he was never really good at it. So he, that's kind of why that <laughs> wasn't really a career. <laughs> so, I mean, at this point, I would venture to say safely that I would probably blow him out of the water. My mom, on the other hand, however, I'm not even going to touch that one. Was, was she just cook everything or was it like mostly like, you know, cookies and desserts and stuff like that? Or was it just a little bit of everything? Uh, just a, kind of a little bit of everything, mostly Italian food. That's kind of what we grew up on. And obviously being a single mom, whatever is quick and easy and cost effective and a lot of, you know, what is it? Crock pot meals and, you know, roasts and things like that that we could just kind of set out in the morning and it'll be done by the time we got home from school at night and shouldn't really have to do too much in that regard. So, but. Always, always delicious. Now, growing up in Medina, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask just because you always get kind of different people. So would it be Browns, Bengals, or Steelers? Browns. That's what I figured, but like it's surprising every once in a while. They're like, oh, yeah, well, you know, my parents like have family in Pittsburgh and, you know, whatever. And then you've been down in Columbus and there's a pretty big Bengals population down here, too. So never really know. So did you always kind of know like you wanted to be a chef? You got a business degree at OSU before going to culinary school, right? Yeah. So I had no idea that I wanted to be a chef whatsoever. I had just, uh, you know, bounced around from restaurant to restaurant that I was cooking in throughout working through school, high school and, you know, college and whatnot. And, you know, I got wasted with one of my buddies, my best buddies one night, and it all kind of fell into place. I was like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> I'm not going to be happy doing anything else other than being in the kitchen and, you know, cooking. So it was kind of written in stone from there. And the next day I enrolled in culinary school. Did you get your business degree or did you just switch over to culinary? I just switched over to culinary. So I was looking at it too. Ohio State doesn't even really have like a culinary program. They have the one culinary program. I think it's like culinary science, which is designed to be like on top of a culinary degree, but not just a basic culinary degree. So everybody kind of has to go to you know Columbus State or somewhere else. Do you know why don't they have any? Like, it just seems really weird that one of the biggest colleges in the country doesn't have a culinary program for people really. Yeah, I don't know. They're mostly focused on the medical aspect of things anyways, in most regards. So, and the business school, obviously. I don't know. I think they should, though. I think it would be a good idea. They could probably do it really well. You went to the Columbus Culinary Institute at Bradford, which is now closed, right? Correct. So why did you pick that instead of, you know, the CIA or somewhere on the West Coast Culinary School or, or something like that? Why did you decide to stay local and, and go there? I mean, I had already lived in Columbus for a couple of years, going to OSU. I really enjoyed it here. Didn't really ever see myself as uh, someone that wanted to live in New York. I've been a couple of times and I love visiting, but I never want to live there. Too big, too big for me. I'm more of a, you know, small town Midwestern guy. I did live in LA for a little while and that just kind of killed big cities for me altogether. Yeah, the main reason why I chose to go to Columbus Culinary over Columbus State is I could get my degree quicker. 
honestly. It seemed grueling going to school five days a week, but I'd already been doing it at OSU. I mean, there, they had a couple different options of the like class times that you could take. Uh, I ended up doing the 6 a.m. class so I could work or go to school from 6 a.m. to noon and then go to work after that and, you know, kind of just rinse and repeat every day. Just get it done. Knowing what you know now about all the different culinary schools, does anything stand out from your time at Bradford that was like completely different than either people that you've talked to or people that you've worked with that have gone to other culinary schools? Like, oh, they did this way different than what you encountered? Or on one hand, the uh, kind of internship or apprenticeship program. I mean, going to Bradford, I was always working. So there was a apprenticeship requirement at the end, but I had already had a job the whole time. So, you know, it just, it didn't make sense to me in that aspect where you're maybe going to school one day a week, but you have to work the rest. I mean, there's nothing wrong with uh, going to school five days a week and working <laughs> as well. A lot of us in the industry have, uh, you know, two, three jobs at all times anyways. So school is just another job to me. But uh, really, I think for the most part that experiences with my culinary schooling and, uh, you know, guys that I've worked with and talked to have relatively been the same. And the biggest thing being that you really get out of it what you put into it. So there's failures and successes at every culinary school, and it's all due to the same thing. You just kind of did enough to skate by. You didn't really invest yourself. You didn't really take this seriously as a career. Uh, I mean, even though despite you're going to school for it, you know, all those same things that you have successes and failures in normal colleges. Running a kitchen and encountering so many different people, what would you say to somebody, you know, who was interested in getting in the field now? Do you think culinary school still makes sense? Or do you think on the job in the kitchen is more valuable? You know, that experience is more valuable than going to culinary school? That's kind of like a twofold answer. One, I think that working in the restaurant is the most important and getting that hands-on experience. But number two, like there has to be at some point where you go out and seek knowledge whether that is culinary school or, you know, you just read a lot of books. I've, I still read almost daily, just learning new techniques. What's coming out? What's the new this? What's the new that? How to do these things differently than, you know, we thought about doing them yesterday or the day before. And that kind of culinary school kind of fills that role, uh, in your learning process. So, uh, whether it's culinary school or you just, you know, take it by the scruff of the neck yourself and go out and seek out the knowledge that is, really the like second most important thing to working in the restaurant industry itself, getting that hands-on experience. So you said you were working throughout the time that you were in culinary school. Where were you working? I started at Marcella's back in 2011. I actually started there after <laughs> working at Hoggies, which was <laughs> like a Columbus institution. I, I still miss that place. They, their barbecue is still amazing and outstanding. Every once in a while, I'll kind of go to that like ghost location that they have there on Bethel. Not quite the same, but, uh, you know, I learned a lot of valuable things by working there, mainly in the like smoking process, smoking meats and whatnot. But yeah, started at Marcella's right at the beginning of culinary school. And it was great because I got something that culinary school will never teach you, which is how to just bang and do volume. I mean, I worked there typically Thursday through Sunday and the cover counts were just ridiculous back then. They were how outrageous, like 500, 600 covers a night, which is super crazy. And uh, it kind of worked out for me too, because it was working in conjunction with what I was learning in, in culinary school at the time, which was soups and sauces. I was learning how to make, you know, all the base stocks and pasta sauces and things like that. So I would kind of learn them at work before I'd learn them at school. And I'd be a little ahead of the curve and, uh, you know, a little bit more confident than I probably should have been. And But yeah, it worked out really well. Was it the location down in the Short North or what location were you working at? Yeah, the Short North location. With working at the barbecue spot, did you know after a little while, you're like, I don't really want to do barbecue? You took away, obviously, you know, smoking meats and everything, but doing barbecue strictly itself is is definitely its own thing. Did you know pretty much right away, like, this is not the style of food that I want to cook? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, when I was that young, I really just wanted to get as much experience as I possibly could and doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and you know, taking what I could from whatever restaurant I was working at at the time and, 
you know, moving on from there. So that was just kind of a stepping stone in my path to just knowledge in general. One day I might do barbecue. I could totally see myself doing that. Uh, I love it. I smoke a lot of meat at home, but still on that path of learning as I probably always will be on and uh, taking in as much as I can. Now, you were also working at the refectory at the same time. So you're working at two different restaurants and going to school. Like, how did that all work? How did you balance all that? <laughs> I was actually also working for uh, like an in-home catering company at the time. It was just uh, me and this old French guy. Awesome guy. Great chef. Taught me a lot in his own respect. We would always do a job and then end up back at his, uh, his, his place, dropping off all the dirty dishes and stuff. And we'd kind of smoke cigars and drink wine and he'd show me some kind of technique or we'd do something cool and he'd tell me some cool stories and I'd gain some extra experience off of that and making money at the same time. So, but uh, yeah, balancing all that stuff was uh, <laughs> difficult at times. There was definitely a period of time where I wasn't very good at go going to school, but I still, uh, you know, passed all my competencies and that sort of stuff. So they kind of overlooked my tardiness or my general absence <laughs> at the end of the day, but really communication and just a lot of Red Bull, making sure uh, each job knew where I was supposed to be when I was supposed to be there and, you know, keeping myself awake to be there. Did Marcellus do like a lunch? So were you like there at lunch and then, then go to the refectory for dinner service? Or would you ever do both on the same day or did you always have them like one or the other? I would always have one or the other. The mornings I just reserved strictly for school when I, you know, when I did make it. That didn't come until after culinary school that I started to work two different jobs in the same day. How did you wind up at the refractory? Because this, if you're looking at like the timeline, like that's only a, what, a couple years probably after he got James Beard nominations and, and everything there. So did you just go in and apply or did you have a connect that got you in there? How did all that work? Uh, yeah, I did both those things. I went and applied, but I also, the other Frenchman that I worked for on the side made a personal phone call uh, and just kind of put in a word for me. Yeah, I got an interview in about a week and decided it was a right fit and ended up leaving Marcella's entirely and just kind of focusing on school and the refectory and the little catering job until I got bored, honestly, and came back to Cameron's. Two years or so later that you wind up going to uh, Cameron's American Bistro, right? Yep. What was it about that restaurant that you wanted to work there specifically? Was there anything that stood out? So to be totally honest, uh, I wanted back in the company, uh, wanted to work too many jobs again. <laughs> like I said, I was getting bored. It wasn't that I was leaving the refectory uh, at the time by any means. I just wanted something else to fill my time and a new experience doing something else that I've never done before. And initially, they put me back at Martini downtown. And I worked there for couple months, kind of sporadically. It wasn't very busy at the time. So they were having a hard time to finding something for me to do. I mean, I was just doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But one day they said, hey, they need some help up at Cameron's. Would you be interested in like transferring up there? And I had never even heard of Cameron's at that point in time. I'm not going to lie. So I was kind of like, what the fuck is that? And where is that? So I've lived in Columbus for a while. I'd Being a student, I didn't have a car. So I never really ventured far. And Worthington was a uh, completely out of the way for me. So the first time I'd ever went to Worthington was the first time that I ever went to Cameron's. So I went up there, talked to the chef at the time, and it sounded like a great fit for me. Like what I was learning kind of on show at Cameron's and, you know, use what I've been learning at the refectory. And it was heavily rooted in the basics. And though it was an American bistro, it still had its roots in, you know, French cooking. So ultimately it was a great fit at the time and uh, really just started working there immediately and fit right in. When you were there, you worked your way up to sous chef, right? You started off on the line and then worked your way up to sous? Actually, I ended up being executive chef at the end of the day there. Uh, yeah, all the way from line cook. I mean, I was washing dishes too whenever they needed it, of course. Uh, that's always the fallback. If you need a dishwasher, I would love to do it. Yeah, I really did everything there by the time that my time was up at Cameron's. But more importantly, that was kind of the first time that you wound up managing and leading others in the kitchen, right? Yeah, I had some like supervisor, kitchen manager roles in the past. But yeah, first uh, kind of official chef job, if you will. What was the biggest challenge with leading an actual kitchen for the first time? Was it just different personalities or did everybody's different working style? Or One of the aspects of that was uh, my own hotheadedness because I was still really young at the time. I was 24, 25 when I was sous chef and uh, executive chef at 26. So 
dealing with my own <laughs> attitude uh, was kind of a hindrance at the time. Uh, and really, uh, I had to learn how to humble myself, as we all do uh, at that age, I feel like, um, especially in that role. And that role really helped me learn how to do that. Uh, but yes, at the same time, you know, I was managing all the guys that I had cooked alongside uh, for so many years. And, you know, they saw me come up from a young green cook all the way. Now I was their sous chef and executive chef. And initially it took a little bit of time to step away from being their friend and transition into, you know, being their boss, so to speak. And you got to learn how to walk that line. Honestly, sometimes it's harder than others. You get in a, I think about like 2015, the Guild House opens. I think you're the executive chef then at an American Bistro. Did you, at that time when they opened the Guild House, whenever they were opening, you know, new properties, did you always have kind of like an eye, like, oh, that'd be kind of cool to work over there? Or were you pretty content at that time at American Bistro, like just running the kitchen, running the restaurant? So when that concept came, came along, or at least, you know, conceptually, I was still a line cook. I was a, the kitchen supervisor at the time. And I wanted that job. I wanted to transfer there. Uh, I wanted to work there. But at the same time, I also was willing to not go there just because I never wanted to work in hotels, though I never had the experience of doing so. I just had it in my mind from what I learned in school and you know operationally that that's just not something that I wanted to do. And ultimately, they wanted me to become the sous chef at Cameron. So cool. I was cool with that. Actually, after leaving the executive chef position at Cameron's and taking a little hiatus, I came back and uh, yeah, got to kind of fulfill that desire to work at the Guildhouse. And I started there as the sous chef. Your little hiatus, was it pocket produce? What exactly was that? It was, there was that fad on Instagram or whatever that was, uh, you know, building layered meals in mason jars, essentially. Ours weren't in mason jars, but it was still the same idea conceptually and like healthy and nutrition based and, you know, organic, all that good stuff. And, you know, being situated in Clintonville, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, and we did get great feedback uh, that just the sales weren't there for us to continue going on and you know, it was a great experience for me to have that experience of opening an independent restaurant, or it was more of like a grab and go, but you know, same idea. Uh, and kind of getting that entrepreneurial experience. But yeah, at the end of the day, it was uh, just not meant to be and moved on from there. Has that concept worked at all? Like, I think a couple months back, there was somebody who did, uh, it was on Shark Tank, and they had like salads, like in a jar or something. I mean, obviously, that concept's been around for, you know, it, least, you know, six, eight, 10 years. Have you seen anybody successfully implement that concept yet? The only place that I know of, and I honestly forget the name, it's in Chicago. uh, And it's a vending machine idea, which makes a ton more sense. And it's just located in a very convenient spot for grab and go. And obviously being a vending machine, very low overhead, you don't have to employ any staff, um, or minimal staff to just kind of produce the food and set it and forget it kind of. But, But other than that, No, honestly. So how did you wind up getting back in at Cameron's? Was it just like put in a call and like, hey, you guys got any openings, you know, looking for a different position or or how did you wind up kind of getting back in? I was kind of talking to a couple of my friends that still worked in the company and but not really taking like an actual active role in seeking out uh, being employed there again. One of my former regional chefs reached out to me via text message, you know, just heard through the grapevine, you're looking to come back into the fold. And, you know, yeah, we actually worked out some details for me to come back and work at the Pearl for a little while to help him out. And, you know, we'd go from there. And that's kind of what happened. You're a sous chef at the Guild House. You also start doing some kind of, you know, special stuff. I think 2018, you did the cooking for the around the table dinner at uh, was it Bloomfield Farms there. Yep. Was that they just reached out to, you know, CMR and like, we're just kind of posted, like who would be interested in doing this? Or did they reach out to you directly? Or how did all that kind of come about? So this is a truly like a small world story, because the person that reached out to me was actually the sister of my good friend when I went to OSU, who I honestly hadn't seen for seven, eight years at that point in time, and had never met his sister, but she worked on this farm. And, you know, just kind of reached out to me and 
got my number from Ricky, her brother, and we went from there. I mean, you've done some pop-up stuff and everything like that, but was it a completely different, like, oh, I have to figure all this out kind of on my own? Or did you have a decent amount of assistance where they kind of knew what they wanted and you just had to work within that, like, guidelines that they had? Or um, So I've done a few of these uh, just throughout my career. I love doing them. I love going out to farm and, you know, using what they've got on hand or using also what they have surrounding them because usually there's farms seem to come in clusters <laughs> around uh, around Ohio. So kind of taking what the one farm has or the collective farms around have and turning them into like a curated meal. And really overall experience is something that I just really enjoy and have fun doing. And like I said, I've done it a couple of times, but yeah, ultimately everything kind of comes down to me from where am I getting plateware? How is that happening? What plates are things going on? I'm prepping all the food and kind of curating the menu and where does service come from? That's, you know, also uh, (laughs) a thing I have to take into consideration. So I get a little bit of, uh, you know, every single hat that you can imagine running a restaurant just on a kind of a smaller scale, which is fun. It's a really fun uh, little chess game to play. A year after that, you wind up becoming the executive chef at the Guild House. How did you find out that, you know, they were promoting you to that role? I was uh, kind of vocal about my uh, desire to become executive chef again, you know, within the company uh, or possibly elsewhere, to be honest. And, uh, you know, looking to step back into that role. And I had actually interviewed with Josh Dalton at at that point in time for 1808 and was very prepared to accept that position and transition to 1808. And they kind of just took me aside and sat me down and were like, would you like to be the executive chef here? It was a tough decision, honestly. It, I, I know that I could have uh, learned a lot from Josh and made a lot of positive changes up there. And who knows where I'd be right now. But for me at the time, it just wasn't the right decision for my life. And the Guildhouse kind of ticked a little bit more boxes than 1808. And here I am. And I mean, you pretty much make like an impact right away. I mean, obviously, some of this stuff would have been laid out, you know, groundwork would have been laid out before you became executive chef. But that same year, Columbus Monthly, I think, ranked it. Guildhouse number nine on the annual like 10 best restaurants list. Was that when you got kind of that alert or, you know, you found out about that? Was that surprising? Was that expected based on everything that you guys were doing there? So that's uh, kind of an interesting thing. Like I am very self-motivated and competitive even, but at the end of the day, I don't really care for awards or recognition at the same time. <laughs> it's a, probably a really strange juxtaposition. I work hard for myself personally. It's just kind of a bonus if there's recognition that comes along with it. So I wasn't seeking it out, but it was you know definitely a pleasant surprise. With being a competitive type chef, do you feel the competitive nature from if you're looking at stuff on Instagram and you see something maybe similar that another restaurant does? It, it doesn't even have to be like Columbus, just a restaurant in general. And you're like, we could do that or we could do that better. Or does that kind of fuel you at all? Or is it strictly like you trying to perfect stuff and ideas that you have going on in your head and executing them on the plate and in the kitchen and everything? And the competitiveness is always a a positive feeling. Like I want you to push me and I'm going to push you back so that we can both, you know, succeed in this and both become better than where we are at right now. So, and that goes for really all of Columbus. You know, I look at stuff that service bar does and Veritas does. And I hope they're looking at shit that I do, honestly, because we're all just trying to make Columbus a little bit better. But, you know, at the same time, uh, yeah, competitiveness with myself and with my teammates, you know, they're always pushing me. I'm always pushing them right back. I want my sous chefs to succeed me at some point in time. So a little healthy competition is always, uh, is always good in the kitchen, you know, and uh, we find ways to have fun with it too just a microcosm of our competition at one point pre COVID, obviously we had a a nice little fermented hot sauce competition going (laughs) for a little while uh, to see who can make the, uh, not only the hottest, but the most tasty. So, you know, you can, you can have fun in competitive ways at the same time. You also did a couple other, I think special dinners, right? It was like a 1700s themed menu might've been inspired by the play Hamilton. Then you also did a, the CMR cook-off which I think you guys actually won, I believe. 
With doing kind of stuff like that, what's the process from inception to execution of doing that stuff? Is it just, you already kind of know you have like a Rolodex kind of, I've always wanted to do this, or I've, you know, kind of done bits and parts of this to, to make something come together for a dish for one of those things? Or is it just like, well, now I have to go see Hamilton the play and figure out like how that all fits or take me through like that part. Like, how do you figure all that stuff out? I mean, I'll start by saying this. I kind of have like professional ADD in the in the regard that uh, I can never really sit, sit still. And I'm always thinking, you know, different things. And as soon as I finish something, I'm kind of bored with it and want to move on to the next after I've made it the best that I could possibly can. But uh, that aside, yeah, I mean, always on the uh, lookout for just new ways to promote the restaurant and have fun myself. Work should always be fun. And, um, you know, sometimes you just kind of let it get to you and you kind of go through the motions, but by seeking out different opportunities to have fun, I think it helps out with, you know, getting through the the day-to-day rigmarole at the end of it. So that's kind of the, uh, basis for seeking those things out. But yeah, you, you got to do the research too, at the same time, there's no real Rolodex of, uh, ideas that I can apply. Just like I said, I, I get bored really easily. So if I've done it already, I'm probably you know, not going to do it again, most likely, but some things I do keep in my back pocket. Cameron Mitchell, I mean, the whole restaurant group's pretty large. I mean, there's what, I think, and I think there's like 14, 15 different, you know, ocean primes across uh, numerous states. And there was one podcast I listened to. I wish I could remember the guy's name, but he was on a podcast, guys out in Denver. He worked within Cameron Mitchell, kind of did some, a lot of stuff with the ocean prime and, and whatnot. And he was talking about just kind of bouncing around between all these different parts of the the restaurant group and everything. Like, did you ever consider doing some of that stuff where it's like, oh, you know, I just want to go and open a bunch of different restaurants for them or do something out of state from Columbus? Did you ever consider any of that? Or were you just like, I really, you know, really enjoy being in Columbus and really want to stay here? Both, really. Um, I'd definitely consider moving out of Columbus. I'd eventually want to come back. I love the Midwest, I will say. I'll be the first one to admit it. I love Cleveland. I love Columbus. Uh, Just two really great cities. But yeah, I'd I'd definitely consider uh, traveling. I love to travel and see uh, different cities, have different experiences while also still working for the same company. It seems like a win-win. And yes, like having a more expanded role in opening restaurants and uh, creating different menus is definitely a goal. And really what I do currently at the Guildhouse and being inside of Le Meridian Hotel, I'm kind of doing that all within my own four walls to, you know, some regard. You're in charge. Not It's not just the restaurant, the Guild House, which is in, like you said, the Meridian Hotel um, downtown and kind of the beginning part of the short north there. You're also in charge of the room service aspect, the food at the bar next door, Soul at the Joseph, and also any hotel like events or banquets, right? So like you're doing all this different stuff. I mean, I know you started as a sous chef, so probably got a little used to it. But when you first started as executive chef, was it ever like overwhelming? Or were you already used to it going through all that stuff as the sous chef where it was just kind of like, I already know how to balance all this stuff and manage my time and the volume and and where I got to be. So definitely, I had that experience when I was a sous chef. You know, after three months of being a sous chef, honestly, there, I was considering my ability to be a chef at all. You know, it was a struggle just acclimating to that hotel atmosphere and everything that you had to be on top of all the time. But like I said, I love the chess game of uh, all the intermoving pieces and eventually figured it out. It became second nature and just forced myself to get exposed to not only breakfast, lunch and dinner at the Guildhouse uh, with the different rotating menus of the hotel, because it's not like they have the same stuff for all the different events and all the different room service uh, menus for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and the bar menus. And, you know, they're wanting to change their stuff seasonally as we change our stuff seasonally. And so you really have to kind of compartmentalize all of this to get your, get your brain around it. But that's why I really love being there, honestly, is because of everything that's going on all the time. And people say that about they love that about working in a normal restaurant. Well, I mean, this is like on steroids <laughs> being in a restaurant and a hotel. But yeah, it's you always have something to do. There's never really any downtime at all. And always really pushing you on to the next menu, the next dish, the next service. It's a lot. But, you know, I love uh, I love being busy. Which is the most challenging part? I would assume it would be the room service. 
just because you also have to count for like time that it gets upstairs and all that stuff. But I mean, you tell me you're the one who's doing it. Really, honestly, the banquet piece real currently pre COVID really easy, but currently just with, uh, you know, not having a full staff upon returning, um, and then trying to build that business back up. So it was really, really slow in the beginning. No one was having meetings, weddings, uh, any of those things that we were having, you know, on a frequent basis before COVID. And then, you know, you get the lift of some restrictions. And then all of a sudden, everyone's flocking back to have their corporate meetings or their retreats or their their wedding now that they can have 200 people again. And <laughs> so that right now has been the most challenging part in uh, coordinating staffing for the most part. Uh, but also the kind of issues with the uh, supply chain that we've had and reworking some of the menus kind of on the fly to accommodate those things has has been the uh, most challenging part currently. Menu conceptualization, you know, when you're going to put a new dish on the menu or you change over the menu, how do you decide which where it should go? Like, you know, if you're going to do something and you're like, oh, well, it would fit at the restaurant, it would fit at the bar, it would also fit for hotel, you know, room service? Or is it like, well, maybe we should just put it over at the bar. That way it leaves us a spot to put something else here on the menu. Like, how do you kind of do that dance of figuring out where stuff should go when you're reworking all this stuff? Really, it all stemmed from playing around in the restaurant. Uh, Whatever we do for our like happy hour menu, that's, you know, kind of fun and bar food sometimes makes its way over to the lobby bar as a menu item uh, from being a feature for us. A lot of dinner features that we create for the restaurant are meant to, you know, be tested to eventually become a menu item of their own. So we do a lot of playing in that regard. Like we got to mess around with it and, you know, see it and touch it and eat it and do all those things over and over and over again before we, you know, kind of let it pass on to that next level of, is this a menu item? Is this going to be on, you know, the actual menu in a couple months or, you know, we like it, but we need to keep messing around with it and we'll shelf it for a little while and maybe come back to it. But then the, the room service piece is kind of a whole different thing in itself because you got to kind of approach it from the aspect of sitting in a hotel room. What can you eat when you're sitting in a hotel room? What is like most applicable to that, to that atmosphere? Like, are you, is it easy to eat this while you're sitting in bed? Uh, do you have, uh, you know, the utensils for this? Do you, you know, all those things. Is this going to travel well from the kitchen all the way up to the ninth floor? So you got to have to also take all those things into, uh, into consideration when thinking about that menu in itself. Um, and then the banquet piece again, like, is this going to hold for 30 minutes? Because the father of the bride decided to have a long winded speech. There's a uh, little intricacies to uh, kind of conceptualizing a menu item for literally each different aspect of the operation. Do people just bring ideas to you for different dishes? I mean, I'm pretty sure Cameron Mitchell Restaurants has, you know, an R&D department. Do you kind of work with them first or is it just kind of like everybody in the kitchen? Like, hey, if you have an idea of something that you want to kind of explore and maybe get on the menu or whatever, like bring it to me. We'll see if it works. But obviously, you know, pretty standard in the industry credit goes to, you know, the restaurant more so than than the actual chef or anything. But is it kind of all those pieces or is there one specifically kind of process that you guys go through? So for the Guildhouse specifically, we have probably the most freedom in creating menu items and dishes and features. Myself, I am constantly working on those things. Like that's probably the last thought I have before going to bed every day. And the first thought I have when I'm waking up is like, what do I want to eat today? And that's kind of where it stems from. Or like, this is going to be cool. I want to play with this or this, you know, sounds fun to me. Sounds like it would be good. Let's give it a shot. But also my door is always open. Like I'm open to suggestions from anyone, really. Like I got a line cook that wants to make tortillas and we're going to build a dish around making tortillas. Uh, It's not going to be a taco because, you know, that's just not conceptually where we are at as a restaurant. But it's, you know, it's going to be an elevated something with tacos. Sous chefs come up with a lot of ideas. I, you know, always push them to get something that they are really, really invested in and really, really interested in and perfect their technique and method and you will incorporate it. I've had a lot of uh, sous chefs interested in fermentation and, you know, different things with koji and um, that all, all always just pushes me too because now I got to figure out what the fuck is, is going on and uh, I get kind of, uh, you know, several different things out of it. I'm learning myself. I'm helping them learn. Uh, we're creating some badass dishes and 
uh, we're making the guests happy. <laughs> so really wins on all fronts. And you even have, I think on the section of the Guildhouse menu, it's like features, which does that change weekly? Is that kind of the spot that you use for like different dishes that you're trying to test out to get feedback on? Or how do you construct that section? You know, because it's not just like, this is our weekly special kind of thing either. There's more to it than that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, those could last for like one day. They could last for a week or they could last for two weeks while we're just tweaking them and tinkering with them and changing this or... Uh, you know, we didn't like this, so we're going to do that instead kind of deal, but keep the same core and really always trying to, like I said, create dishes that are eventually going to make their way onto the menu. And uh, yeah, kind of go from there. It's it's really a lot of playing around and, you know, talking amongst ourselves. And we have two different feature programs currently going on. And one is uh, we call it the Gilded Hour, which is like our happy hour bar menu. Uh, that we do that's got like a, a handful of small plate ideas on it that will eventually be uh, testing around for what we do with our apps and side section and uh, even the raw section of the menu itself. Uh, and then we have our kind of daily dinner feature that we do. You know, we try to incorporate whatever new techniques that we're uh, working on or perfecting, uh, what have you. And also using that as an outlet, we work with a lot of local farm partners that we have. Uh, use that as an outlet to kind of get them out there too and, you know, bring great local food to the people at the end of the day. How often do you guys change over like the menu? Do you do it with just the seasons because of what the farmers are growing? Or I think you guys have farms that will grow, you know, to your specifications too. Or do you slowly like, you know, maybe you take five things off the menu and put five new things on and then, you know, a month later you take another two off and, and replace those? Or how do you do that? So before COVID, it was definitely seasonal. Now it's a little bit more fluid, I would say, just because the ease at which we can change menus with the QR codes and you know the adaptations that we've made during uh, the pandemic. So we are afforded that ability to like we're going to change five things here and two things there, and but still at the end of the day, it's all about seasonality. And uh, we do have some farmers that'll grow to our specifications and like what we're looking for and whatnot. But also there's always that conversation of what do you guys have? What are you growing? What do you have the most of? What are you like really into? What are you behind as, as far as what you're growing? Like, what do you think tastes the best <laughs> is the freshest? And, you know, so those sort of, sort of things, it's always a conversation. How do you guys judge, like, you know, when you put something new on the menu or it's only been on there like a couple of weeks, how do you guys judge or analyze if it's working or if it isn't working, is it the amount of food coming back on a plate? Is it number of times it was ordered during like a week, a day, a month? Or or how do you figure out like it's clear that like this isn't really working? We need to either revise this or take it off, put something else on there? Or First, it starts with uh, inflection, kind of looking in and like, are we putting out the best version of this that we possibly can? Are we making this the best that it can be? And the answer always has to be yes. And if it's no, then, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board on it. Then second, we're really always soliciting feedback from the service staff. Like, what are you hearing in the dining room? What are you hearing from your guests? And then, yeah, the third piece is like, how often is it getting ordered during a day, a week, a month? Are people coming back for this item consistently? You know, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a a culmination of all three of those aspects of it. Do you think there's still like a, a stigma around being like a corporate chef. I mean, your situation's a little bit different because there's the hotel aspect, you're doing all these different things, but there used to be kind of that stigma. Like if somebody is working for a corporation or like a hotel restaurant or something like that, it was, I don't want to say like deemed like to be less than, but maybe on this, like this barometer, you know, just a little bit lower than if somebody was a chef owner of a restaurant. Do you think that's still the case or do you think it's changed since, you know, the past few years and then COVID obviously changed that where people were like, well, yeah, if somebody wants to fund this, like, great, because of, you know, how everything went with COVID and no real support from government and all that stuff for businesses outside of like the PPP loan stuff. So, I mean, do you think it's still the same or do you think it's changed a bit? Honestly, I still think it's the same. I still think there's a little bit of a stigma that uh, comes with being a corporate chef, you know, a couple different things that, you know, we're good operators, but maybe not so good at the, at the culinary side of things, kind of bland, if you will, in our uh, ways and techniques. But hopefully uh, we're proving people otherwise in the long run. Yeah, I mean, you guys have to probably be a little bit more adaptable, right? Because, I mean, you have to deal with all four of those aspects. So you have to figure out, even if you took the same dish 
it's not going to look the same in the restaurant, at the bar, for room service, or for the catering, right? So you constantly are tinkering with stuff, whether it's technique or making it last longer or whatever, right? Yeah, absolutely. We have to have all those skills. Plus, I mean, we're running Cameron's marquee restaurant, too, at the same time. So the food has to be top-notch at all times and up to the toughest standards of the entire company. My bosses always say that we're kind of rated on a higher scale uh, because of that. And we feel that when we're uh, kind of doing new menu conceptualization. And, you know, there's a lot of frustration at times. But at the end of the day, like, we have standards to live up to in the restaurant. And then, yeah, we have to have all those other little uh, kind of Swiss army knife thoughts and techniques to apply to every other aspect of our service that we do with the hotel. How would you say the Guildhouse has changed over the past six years, you know, since it's opened and then since you've been there, like, has it changed, evolved a lot, or is it still kind of the same, but just things kind of update or modern or? So, yeah, it's, I feel like it's changed a lot. I know that I personally made a lot of change uh, as soon as I took over. You know, we used to do a lot of globally inspired dishes with different ingredients from here and there and kind of working more on that high end New York vibe. I'm kind of more in the more local is better uh, as much as possible, highlighting all the uh, hard workers around Columbus and Ohio and um, really the tri-state area if I can. Like we do a lot of business with uh, growers and artisans in Kentucky, um, Indiana, Pennsylvania, that kind of thing. And it's really great to build those relationships with those people and, you know, hear the stories behind what they're producing or what they're making or why they're doing it. And, you know, you can taste it in the food. It's just flat out better. In regards to like style, yes, we're becoming more and more modern, but also kind of keeping in mind the thought of like being perfectly imperfect at the same time. So you're going to have a a great, great tasting meal, but it's not going to like, you're not going to look at it and wonder what the fuck it is at the same time. Like I've been to a couple of restaurants where I'm like, I'm not sure what this is exactly. It looks, it's, it's this thing, but it actually looks like that. And uh, that's cool and all, but you know, I, I've dabbled in a little bit of that, but at the end of the day, like just organically plating things and letting the ingredients kind of speak for themselves uh, is what we're moving towards because we have these great products. So like let them speak for themselves. So with Cameron's being such kind of a large company, you know, obviously they have purveyors, different farms. Do you just kind of visit all the farms and pick like which ones kind of work best for the ingredients and the style that you guys cook with? Or is it, oh, I also heard about this place like over in Indiana that's growing, you know, this amazing stuff. I'm going to go check it out and see if we can get them on the purveyor list. Or how does kind of that all structure? Uh, So it's kind of uh, really loosely structured on my end, um, just because I'm always keeping my ear to the ground for this or that or whoever uh, really has great, great products. So the kind of that list is ever rotating for me. Not that I'm like shedding them and, and getting new ones, but keep them all around. But just working with each individual one about what's best that we can, you know, kind of work together and help each other out and products that you have that we want and vice versa. So but at the same time, yeah, seeking out the ones that we haven't heard of, honestly, is a big part of the job. Uh, we just put Joyce Farms chicken on the menu uh, a couple menu changes ago. The, their Poulet Rouge, uh, which is out of North Carolina. Great, great product, but we had to do some digging and uh, logistical work to get it. But it all stemmed really from like an Instagram post from Sean Brock, I believe it was, uh, talking about Joyce Farms. And we're like, you know what? If this is the best chicken, then we should be serving the best chicken too. So that's kind of a microcosm of kind of how we go about doing what we do and sourcing how we source. Now, because of COVID, the hotel, restaurant, everything was closed for most of the pandemic, right? It wasn't open, never really switched to takeout or anything. What did you do with all your downtime? I smoked a lot of meat, honestly. Living in Plain City, I had Blues Creek right around the corner, Blues Creek Farm. So, uh, you know, I was going there and getting different cuts every week and we ate a lot of smoked meats. So that and, you know, it was perfect time for gardening. I spent a lot of time in the garden and still a lot of cooking. Honestly, I just kept doing what I always do. With the smoking and curing meats, and then I think also, I don't know if you still do, but you were fermenting wine too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Has 
any of that ever made its way onto the menu or, or will you ever like do like a one-off or anything like that for like a special menu of stuff that like you've cured or, or anything like that? Uh, yeah, we um, do incorporate those techniques. Uh, we still do a lot of stuff with fermentation, just little things and uh, incorporating them into dishes in subtle ways. There was a point in time where we got a whole hog from Jamie Anderson. And of course, uh, there was a plethora of pieces and parts that got cured for the usual when you're dealing with the whole pig. And whether it's salt cured or curing in butter or, you know, what have you, we do incorporate those things as well. And uh, every once in a while, we'll smoke some things. And, you know, we just kind of have to make a makeshift smoker what we can. And still, at the end of the day, make it great and have fun doing it and put out a great product. Since you've been involved in restaurants and stuff in Columbus, how do you think the the food scene has changed since you first got into the industry? Do you do you think it's changed enough? Where do you see it going, you know, for the rest of the decade? I don't think it's changed enough by any means, um, but it has a come a long way since when I first moved to Columbus. I feel spoiled being from Cleveland. We've always had so much, you know, ethnic food and everyone took pride in having their independent restaurant and making everything from scratch. And I don't feel like that was the case when I first moved here. There was, it's just a lot of chains and fast food and things like that, but it's definitely going away and it's definitely, definitely being replaced by those, uh, independent guys that are, uh, you know, making waves and killing it and creating some bomb ass dishes. And, you know, really it has a, a long way to go still. And I hope that it only continues on that upward trajectory. Do you think there'll ever be like a specific kind of concept or, or style that, or maybe even just kind of genre of food that takes over Columbus again, like the chains did, or do you think it's just going to be like more diverse, just getting more and more diverse over the next five, 10 years? I'm hoping for diversity. <laughs> a lot of those, uh, you know, smaller guys are starting to become medium sized guys and don't want to see it move back towards the chain situation. But the concepts that they're putting out are not all the same which is, you know, the, uh, the bright side of it. It's not creating one restaurant concept and then opening tons of locations. It's, you know, multi concept companies that these uh, guys are coming out with and it's great. And they're, you know, giving us a uh, taste for stuff that we haven't had before. So looking forward to that. What's next for you professionally as a chef? Is it continue doing your thing at the guild house for a while? Do one day you want to open a restaurant of your own or are you just happy in the corporate environment or? I think that, uh, you know, everything's on the table still. Like I said, I've got a little bit of professional ADD and always like to keep learning new stuff and keep doing new things and keeping busy. And one week I'm going to want to do chocolate and be uh, living the life of a chocolatier. And next week I'm doing this and exploring this region of, you know, Spain or wherever. And, you know, just a little bit of everything. We'll see where it goes. I'm still waiting for that uh that one defining moment to point me in one direction. So even at the age I am still, uh, you know, learning and growing every day and doing what I do. So we got a few more questions for you. I ask these to everybody. So everybody, listeners can have like a compare and contrast. Who would you say is the biggest influence on your career thus far? So, I mean, I keep referring to this French guy. I might as well give him a name. His name was uh, Marc Dula. That was the uh, chef that mentored me as a, as a young culinarian and um, taught me a lot of things and probably wouldn't be where I am now if I didn't have his guidance. I also have a father, pretty much like a sec second father uh, of one of my best friends from like middle school, high school time. He was a chef uh, when we were growing up. So I was kind of with him in the kitchen too and cooking food and worked with him a couple times and uh, kind of motivated me in this direction as well. So I look up to him as well and, and uh, kind of creating this path for me. But yeah, overall, I, I guess uh, watch a lot of Anthony Bourdain. <laughs> I know you're a fan as well. Really just uh, creating those emotions for others like you get from watching Anthony Bourdain or reading any of his books uh, has always been uh, something that I've chased. If you can elicit those, like that's at the end of the day, what why we all cook is to elicit those emotions of experiencing another culture or sharing food with friends or family or, or strangers even. And at that moment, being on the same page is really overall why, why we all do this. So, uh, and he really just highlighted all of those aspects of, of food and cooking and eating and traveling. So yeah, did a lot for kind of guiding me in this direction as well. What's the one kitchen item that's not a knife that you can't live without? Probably a notebook. <laughs> I have a horrible, horrible memory. And 
uh, so many different to-do lists to, to get down. And if I have a thought on, you know, a dish for uh, special in a week or tomorrow, or uh, I need to plan out my thoughts for 10 minutes from now, <laughs> I'm always in my notebook, um, pen and pad. I actually uh, do freelance writing on the side as well. I'm a chef consultant for a uh, men's lifestyle blog. So I'm always writing down recipes for them or commenting on whatever and, you know, always have the notebook handy. The one thing in a restaurant that you would not fix yourself, it breaks and you're like, I'm not touching that. I'm not dealing with it. I'm calling somebody. Uh, at this point in time, um, I've pretty much become a jack of all trades and I can do a lot as long as I have the parts that I need to fix it. The stuff that I really shy away from is anything electrical related. <laughs> and that's just stemming from um, many, many moons ago uh, at Cameron's. We had a fan go out in the freezer. Uh, it was like a, a standing freezer, so not like a walk-in freezer or anything. My dumbass forgot to unplug the thing before, <laughs> before fucking with it. So I got a nice little shock and uh, learned my lesson on that. And just don't want to have that same experience again. <laughs> What's the one restaurant in Columbus that you'd recommend that isn't your own? So a scenario I always give is uh, somebody's you know flying through Columbus, flight gets delayed, or you know maintenance issues not leave until the next morning they reach out to you you guys are closed that day and you say hey you should probably go here to grab a bite to eat uh i mean there's a lot of them honestly we have a lot of great restaurants around here really it just depends on what you're looking for they're open they're open to anything it's just what's the one spot that you know they're like hey just just point me in the direction of something good like where would you go uh either tensuki market or mishiku and have uh ramen and some chicken karage maybe some uh Takiyaki while I'm there. Uh, bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant that you want to go to, but have been. Ooh, bucket list restaurant is an easy one. I do a good bit of traveling uh, internationally, and it tends to be the bar that I end up at the end of the night, just because you know the the local places in whatever city at the end of the night always ha tend to have the best food, and you know just drinking wine and typically surrounded by other travelers and people from wherever and everyone's uh, a little inebriated and the uh, conversations flowing. So those are always my, my bucket list restaurants, bucket list travel destination. I'd probably have to say uh, Lebanon or Morocco. Beirut is very high on that list there, but you know, I've had the opportunity to go to Tangier uh, when I've been in Spain and just didn't end up working out. And I've always wanted to visit there. Yeah, really just a lot of different places in the Middle East. I feel like those are the least traveled, but some of the most interesting places historically, culinarily, socially, to me, uh, after already having traveled uh, a good a bit of Europe already. So that's next on the list. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? Oh my God. <laughs> got a, I've got plenty of those. Probably one of the craziest things I've seen from my very younger years. And I will never forget this guy is very vigorously cutting chicken, probably not completely in the right state of mind, if you know what I mean. And he cuts off the majority of one of his fingers and without missing a beat, puts a towel in his mouth and turns around and puts it on the flat top. Did he go to get it sewn back on? No, no. No. Yeah, I was like, you're taking uh, a couple days off. And uh, yeah, just let us know. <laughs> but yeah, that was some crazy shit. Food or drink, uh, guilty pleasure. Ooh, I've got a lot of those too. I uh, I actually have a gluten intolerance. So I try to stay away from bread and pizza and things and macaroni and cheese specifically. <laughs> uh, and I do a pretty good job of it. But I love all those things <laughs> um especially pizza so i try not to do it so much anymore but you know every once in a while if i'm really really in the in the mood and have a huge hankering i'll, I'll go get some pizza somewhere um but yeah ice cream's on the top of that list too i'd probably say i have a big sweet tooth at the same time uh love chocolate i try to only keep the good stuff around what's the good stuff you know like the uh somewhere between 90 and 100% cacao, uh, chocolate bars, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I love the super bitter, but I, I also don't discriminate against the sweet chocolate. So there's that as well. What's your kind of favorite dish that one thing that you've cooked, created that you kind of look back on and that's kind of the moment that you look to and it's like, oh yeah, this all kind of came together there. And, and that was kind of like the first time that you're like, I could definitely do this like professionally. Probably uh, mastering cooking eggs. <laughs> one of the 
one of the places I cooked when I was a um, a teenager. Honestly, I had such a rough time uh, cooking eggs for you know breakfast. But as soon as they clicked, I was like, "Yeah, I can fucking do this. This is I got this. If I can, if I can master that, doing eggs, all different kinds of eggs on the flat top. I there's nothing I can't I can't do. <laughs> you know, I was like 17, 18, 19 at that point in time, and I was pretty sure that I could do anything that I wanted to do. But getting that uh, getting that skill down was uh, definitely a confidence booster. Favorite Anthony Bourdain moment, scene, episode? Uh, is there anything that stands out particularly? Ooh, most of the ones that he's doing with Eric Repair in either France or anywhere they're eating spicy food, uh, <laughs> which is always hilarious. And then there are, you know, a lot of his episodes that are just uh, emotionally compelling, where he's going to wherever he's going to and just uh, really exuding the social climate, the food scene, you know, the breaking the perception of that place at the same time um, and going to places that you wouldn't you wouldn't normally think to travel to, honestly. Love the one that he did in Beirut. Love the one that he did with Serge Tankin in uh, Armenia. Yeah, I honestly have a lot of favorites. I only continue to rewatch them, to be totally honest. It's the easy, like, throw it on at the end of the night for some noise and, you know. Where can uh, people find you? Social media, website, reservations, plug everything. The magazine that you consult for, all that stuff. The majority of the time at the Guild House. <laughs> Sometimes I seriously contemplate just, uh, you know, Get, getting myself a permanent guest room in the hotel. <laughs> yeah, I got a. I've got an Instagram account. Um, I sometimes use it. Yeah, mostly at the restaurant though. We are open every day. Brunch on the weekends, right? We are currently just doing brunch on holidays. However, we will be going back to brunch shortly. That is uh, kind of all dependent on kind of staffing related issues right now, but tentatively for middle of July at this point. But we'll see what happens. I think everything is still fluid at this point in time. Yes, that is the ultimate goal to go back to breakfast, lunch and dinner and brunch on the weekends. But still at this point, we're open for dinner service 365. Yeah, the only day I think you guys are closed is Christmas, right? There's like two days of the year that you guys are actually closed. It's like, Yeah, but the caveat with that is the guild house is closed. However, excuse me, we're still there for the hotel, for their lobby bar, for their in-room dining, um, that sort of thing. So, I mean, you're running a hotel, people are still there on the holidays and they've got to eat somehow. We're there to feed them. Again, appreciate you coming on. I mean, the Guild House, you know, it's kind of our go-to, especially around the holidays when it's like we're not traveling or something like that. And it's like, where are we going to go? And it's like the Guild House is just kind of always open. We've always had great meals there. You know, even though I'm not like a, a big brunch person, I mean, we've gone you know there for lunch on the weekends and stuff. And there's there's something for everybody on the menu, too, as well. I mean, it's always been great experience. It's always pretty busy in there, too, as well. So do you recommend making reservations? Absolutely. It's an awesome restaurant right downtown. It's, you know, like you said, Cameron Mitchell's kind of, I consider it to be the flagship restaurant too as well, um, more so than, you know, Ocean Prime or M was or anything like that. But yeah, appreciate you coming on and uh, we'll be seeing you soon at the Guild House for sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again to Chef Matt Walton for coming on the podcast, taking some time out on an off day to come on and talk about the Guild House and his experience and everything like that. So it was really awesome to kind of get that perspective. Make sure you check out his Instagram at matt.e.walton and also at the Guild House. Make sure if you haven't been to the Guild House, give it a try. Highly recommend it. They're pretty much open all the time uh, for lunch, dinner. So just hop on their website. You can make a reservation. I think they use Open Table for the, the reservations there. Yeah, definitely make sure you check it out. Highly recommend it. Also, make sure to follow our Instagram at Spoon Mob on Instagram. We had a little issue with Instagram for like about a week or so. We weren't able to post like captions for some reason. I don't know exactly what it was. I think it was a glitch in the app or whatever, but it looks like it finally got fixed. So apologies if you were kind of like looking at some posts and were like, this seems different. Like what's going on? We got all that fixed, all that corrected. So we're kind of back online there. Also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook at SpoonMob1 on both those platforms. But check out the website, SpoonMob.com. New chef profiles constantly going up. Just did a bunch of stuff for some chefs out in Hawaii from when we went on vacation a couple months ago. So finally got that stuff uploaded and everything. So check that out. A lot of sushi. That was kind of the theme of the trip. So uh, there's some other stuff in there too as well. We went to Senya and PAI Honolulu. But definitely check out you know Sushi Show and Mario Sushi, Sushi Ginza on Odera, Hawaii. So we'll be posting some of that stuff to the Instagram too, as well. Some of the photos that I took. Unlikely that we'll have most of those sushi chefs on the podcast, uh, unless I learn Japanese, just because most of them, English is not their first language and they're not fluent in it. 
unless I can figure out a way to, you know, maybe do like a translation or somehow through maybe like an interpreter. But we got a lot more chefs coming on uh, the podcast scheduled to come on. So make sure to check out past episodes. You know, we had Sheridan Sue on recently. I think that was last week's episode. He's out in Vegas. We had Kendi Warden, who's a sommelier here in Columbus, does uh, The Grape Grind, which is kind of like a wide education website. We had Greg Stokes, who's an advanced SOM, going for his master SOM. He's also here in Columbus. We also have had Thatcher Baker Briggs, who's another SOM. Uh, Brandon Grissetti, who's the owner of Pigeon up in Vancouver, which is one of my favorite restaurant experiences that I've had so far. So check out all those episodes. They're all different. They're all unique. You know, we try and just kind of talk to as many different people that we can and, and different unique voices and stuff and get different perspectives on, you know, just people come from different backgrounds. So it's always interesting to, you know, compare and contrast and hear different stories. And and hopefully it's entertaining for everybody. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully maybe something's been, you know, inspirational too in, in that you've picked up along the way. And if you're either in the industry or just kind of a food fan or thinking about doing your own thing or or whatever. So appreciate everybody listening. Make sure to check out Parts Now Known. Those podcasts come out on Wednesdays. I haven't done a restaurant review in a few weeks. Those are kind of on pause right now. Might be doing something else with that. That might be going on a different platform. More to come um, once that kind of gets finalized. Yeah, like I said, appreciate everybody listening. Follow us on Instagram. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. Help spread the word. Friends, family, after looking for content, looking for something, tell them to check us out. Appreciate everybody. Talk to you guys next week.